Hey everyone, it is time for our yearly English language learner training. We're going to talk about the WIDA standards, which is not new. We've had this conversation before, we've had this training before. Um, a lot of the information is going to be review, but it's good to have this refresher to make sure that we are making our content and our educational experiences relevant and helpful to all of our students, including our English language learners. We're going to talk about what WIDA is. We'll talk about language acquisition and development, academic language development. We'll talk about differentiation in those can-do descriptors that you remember from the past. The English language, sorry, went too far. The WIDA standards, there we go. The WIDA standards are going to cover all five areas of English language development. The social instructional language as well as the academic language of language arts, math, science, and social studies. So there are five different strands that we'll talk about. The, the standards look something like this. You'll notice that the cognitive function is the same for all students. The content that we want them to be able to do doesn't change, but the way that they demonstrate that content is going to change based on their English language levels, level one through five, and then the, the d domain that we're working with. Sorry, I'm stuttering a little bit. The domain that we're working with. So a student who is a level one in speaking is going to be able to demonstrate their information by, for example, stating how energy transfers, using some visual support, some pictures, and that sort of thing. But a student who is at level five, which is almost the same level as a native English speaker, would be able to, to discuss how energy transfers and be able to use some graphic supports. So it's the way that they demonstrate their, their understanding of the content is going to differ based on the level of their English language ability. You're going to be getting a copy of the accommodation form for each of our English language learners if you have not gotten it already. And that's going to tell you for each domain, speaking, listening, reading, writing, you're going to know what level your students are at, and that will help you to understand what they should be able to do when you are working with them in your live lessons or in an individual session or what to expect on their assessments. You can find a lot of information on the WIDA website, WIDA.us. You can click on that download library. You see an orange arrow pointing to it. There you'll be able to find the standards, the guiding principles, the can-do descriptors, which have actually been updated. So you'll want to download those again, even if you had them saved in the past, and some sample lesson plans. There are 10 guiding principles of WIDA. The first one is that their language, and the student's language and culture is a valuable resource that we need to tap into when we are incorporating their, when we are trying to teach them, basically. We're going to incorporate their language and culture into what we are doing because that's not happening in a vacuum. They didn't come from nothing and now they are in our, in our school. They came from a rich history and we need to tap into that while we are trying to get them up to speed with us. Their home, school, and community experiences influence their language development. They draw on their metacognitive, metalinguistic, and metacultural awareness to develop proficiency in additional languages. Their academic language and their native language is going to also affect their academic language development in English, and vice versa. Students learn language and culture through meaningful use and interaction. Not just words on a page, not just words on a computer screen, but through a meaningful interaction with teachers and other students. They use language in functional and communicative, communicative ways Sorry, that vary according to context. The way that they use language when they are hanging out with their friends is going to be different than the way they use language in their emails, and it's going to be different than the way they use language in a live lesson. There are different ways to use the English language, and it's going to develop at different stages. They develop language proficiency in listening, speaking, reading, and writing interdependently, but at different rates and in different ways. So a student may be at a level two in writing and a level five in listening, and that's okay. They're going to develop separately from each other, but they're also connected to each other. 
The development of academic language and content knowledge are an interrelated process. They are going to be learning your content and learning the language at the same time, and those two are going to be connected to each other. Their development of social, instructional, and academic language is a complex and long-term process. It takes five to seven years to learn a new language and to become fluent in it. So this is a complex process. It's not something that is going to happen overnight, but it is a foundation for what they are going to be able to do for the rest of high school and then after in their careers or in college. Their access to instructional tasks that requires complex thinking is enhanced when the linguistic complexity and instructional support match their levels of language proficiency. That makes sense, right? Because if I have the ability to do something, but I don't understand what I'm supposed to do because of the language barrier, then I'm not going to be able to demonstrate what I know. But if we can somehow reach them on their language levels, then we'll be able to see the content knowledge that they do understand and that we can pull out of them based on, um, on their abilities in the content, not just the language. Language acquisition and academic language development. EL is going to stand for the English language. ELL is an English language learner. LEP is a student with limited English proficiency. The native language is the one that they were born, not born with, but the one that they were born into, the family, the language that the family spoke when they were, um, when they were born. L1 is that native language. L2 is the second language. For most of us, it's going to be a native language would be, for us, Russian or Spanish most of the time. And then the second language, obviously, is typically going to be English. As students are learning this second language, or for us, as students are learning the English language, there are several things that are going to factor into it. How similar their first language is to the second language that they're trying to learn. The level of their native language proficiency. If they were struggling with language development when they were um, coming from their other environments, then they will struggle with it here, and we need to take that into consideration. Their previous experience and knowledge of the English language, if they are new to English completely, they're going to have a different, um, a different ability and skill set than they will if they've been working on it for several years. And then their, lang their first, their native language status. So if they struggled, again, with their native language, they're going to have a harder time acquiring a second language. You also have to take into consideration how motivated they are, how much they want to be here, how much they want to be learning English, how old they are. Um, if we have a student who's 20, they're going to be handling it differently than a student who's 14. Their personality, as we all know, some students are going to be more motivated just intrinsically than others. And we also need to take into consideration the disabilities that they may have. They may have a 504 plan, they may have an IEP, and we need to take that into consideration. And then we have to look at their access to the language and the quality of their instruction. So if they have no access to English outside of what we are doing in the online classroom, that's going to affect the student. If they have access to it within their home and within their community, then that will help, help them. It will benefit them as they're learning the English language. And then the quality of instruction. That's where, it, where we come in. It's our job to make sure we are providing them the highest quality instruction that we can to help them acquire that second language. We've talked in the past about the two different kinds of language. You've got the conversational language, which they call BICS basic interpersonal communication skills, and we call that their playground English. It's what they're going to use when they're hanging out with their friends and talking. This, the topics that they're talking about are not going to be cognitively demanding. They're not talking about uh, the laws of gravity or how to solve a quadratic equation. They're talking about what they want to do next weekend. And then we have academic language, which they abbreviate CALP, Cognitive Academic Language Proficiency, which is more cognitively demanding. They might be really good at speaking in that playground language, but struggle with their academic language, and that's normal. For the sake of time, I'm just going to throw some of this up here. There we go. When a student asks permission to see the nurse, that's that playground language, the BICS. A student describes what he did over the weekend, that's that play, playground language again. 
If they're writing a paragraph that compares and contrasts two quadrilaterals, that would be the academic language. If they're trying to understand a movie about a futuristic event, that's actually going to be an academic language because they're trying to do something that's a little bit more cognitively demanding. Asking for clarification in a science class is academic language. Describing her favorite president is academic language. Evaluating which president is the best is academic. Being able to understand a lecture on photosynthesis is academic. And this third one is a little bit um, iffier. <clears throat> if here, a student is able to write a letter of apology to another student. While it's a letter of apology, and it looks like it could be that playground language because they're just talking to another student, um, it could also incorporate some of that academic language because they're trying to, light, to write a letter which is going to be a little bit more cognitively demanding. But because it's going to another student, it has a tendency to be a little bit more of that playground language. Differentiation, this is something that we're actually pretty skilled at here at Odyssey Online Learning, I believe, because we're meeting students where they are rather than where they need to be. Um, we are meeting them where we actually find them. We don't have to take an entire group of students and say everybody needs to be in the same place and we're going to move from here. We meet the students where they are. And so we differentiate by modifying the presentation of the content, the process, the product, or the learning environment based on how ready they are their interests and their learning profiles. How do we differentiate for our English language learners? Well, you make sure that it, the content is comprehensible, that they can understanding, understand it, that it is challenging, but that we also meet their language needs. We're going to use scaffolding and supports. Scaffolding is when you build on the skills that they already have. Supports are those tools or the strategies that you use to make sure that they can move from one to the next. Here are some examples of some supports. I'm not going to read through all of them. You can pause the video and look at it if you would like to. Some different examples of ways that we can support our students. Some of this will work with what we do. Some of it, not so much. We differentiate, differentiate effectively by determining where they are, figuring out what they can do, looking at what the gap is between what they can do and what they're expected to be able to do, and then figuring out strategies that we can use to get them where they need to be. The can-do philosophy looks at what they are able to do, not what they can't do, but what they are able to do and builds from that. We use what we call the can-do descriptors. Let's see if I, no, nope, I don't have it any bigger. The can-do descriptors are going to look at the different levels for the different uh, language domains, listening, speaking, reading, writing, looks at the level that they're at, and it gives you some examples of ways that you can ask them to demonstrate learning. What are the things that they can do based on their language level in each of those domains? It is going to provide a tool for differentiating. It's going to give um, a sample of things that they're able to do, but it's not going to replace the standards. It's not going to give an exhaustive list of everything they can do. It's not going to represent their language development trajectory, which means that they may be able to jump from a level one all the way to a level three. They don't have to go exactly one step at a time. As they are learning the language, they may jump several levels at once, once they kind of catch on a little bit. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, I'm going to send a link as well to a form that I need you to fill out to show that you did listen to this video. If you have any questions at all, let me know. Along with this video, you'll be getting that form to fill out. And then if you have a student who is an English language learner, we'll make sure that you have a copy of their accommodation plan as well. Thanks.